If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And I want to share with you about a recipe for rejoicing in the Lord. A recipe for rejoicing in the Lord. Good to be home. We were in Florida for a little bit. Last weekend we were in New Jersey down with our friend Pastor Tate. Uh, but, you know, there's no place like home. So we're happy to be back at harvest time this morning. Philippians 3. Beginning in verse 1, a recipe for rejoicing in the Lord. Paul says in Philippians 3, 1, Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision. We who worship God by his spirit, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, blameless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. A recipe for rejoicing in the Lord. How can we remain joyful in troubled times? When we've suffered setbacks, when we've had losses, when we're trapped in a situation that's uncomfortable, that's oppressive, when there's tension in our personal relationships. When the future is very uncertain, when we're not sure what's going to happen, when we're really not sure if we're going to live or if we're going to die. How do we stay positive? How do we remain hopeful? How could we possibly enjoy today when we're sad about what happened yesterday or when we're worried about what might happen tomorrow? How can we maintain a joyful spirit? Philippians is one of four prison epistles, prison letters that Paul wrote while he was in chains in Rome. Actually, Paul was in prison for five years, two years in Israel, one year on a transport ship during which he was shipwrecked and snake bitten, and now two years in Rome. Paul was literally chained 24 hours a day, seven days a week, while he was awaiting trial on capital charges in front of Emperor Nero. Paul had really been through the mill, and now he didn't know whether he was going to be acquitted or executed. Nevertheless, this little letter to the Philippians is known as the letter of joy. Joy and Rejoicing are mentioned 15 times in these four chapters, more than any other letter in the New Testament. The whole letter overflows with joyful optimism. I continually pray for you with joy, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion. I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice because I know that through your prayers and the total supply of the Spirit, I will be delivered and Christ will be exalted. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Paul is not depressed. Paul is not anxious. Paul is not angry. Paul is not overwhelmed. He's not in despair. He is joyful and faith-filled and hopeful. 
Actually, there's a progression in this letter. In chapter 1, Paul says, I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. In chapter 2, Paul says, I am glad to rejoice with all of you, so you too should rejoice with me. And now in chapter 3, Paul says, finally, my brothers, you rejoice in the Lord. So there's the progression. Chapter 1, I rejoice. Chapter 2, we rejoice together. Chapter 3, now you rejoice. You learn how to rejoice in the Lord just like I have learned to do because it is a safeguard for you. That word safeguard, it means a fortress. You know, there's one other place in the Bible where that word appears. It's in the book of Nehemiah. When the people of Jerusalem went back and began to rebuild the city after it was utterly destroyed... The priest Ezra began to read the Old Testament scriptures to them and their hearts were pierced with conviction when they realized how far their country had fallen. They had once had everything and they lost it all. But Nehemiah said to them, don't you grieve. The joy of the Lord is your... What to say? The joy of the Lord is your... Strength. You know what that word strength means? It means a mountaintop fortress. When you've made terrible mistakes, when you've suffered setbacks, when you've had losses, when you're grieving, when you're suffering from regret, the joy of the Lord is your strength. When the enemy has torn everything you built to the ground, when you don't have any walls, when you don't have any one left to defend you, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your mountaintop fortress. You see, rejoicing in the Lord is a fortress for us. It safeguards us from everything the enemy wants to put on us. The enemy wants to put anxiety on us. He wants to put depression. He wants to put despair, anger, bitterness, self-pity. He wants to cajole us into compromising and quitting. But the joy of the Lord is a fortress for us. So, So how do we do that? How do we rejoice in the Lord every day and especially during the tough days? Looking at Paul's words in Philippians 3, I find a simple recipe for rejoicing in the Lord, and I want to share it with you quickly this morning. A simple recipe for rejoicing in the Lord. First of all, to rejoice in the Lord, avoid the trap of self-righteous religion. Avoid the trap of self-righteous religion. Paul gives the command for us to rejoice in the Lord because it's a safeguard for us, And then he immediately issues a stiff warning to watch out for teachers who are trying to snare people in religion. In fact, Paul's words are so sharp in chapter 3 that they almost seem out of character with the rest of this letter. Paul is talking about a group of teachers called the Judaizers. The Judaizers were Jews who claimed to be believers in Jesus But they went around to the Gentile churches teaching that in order to be fully saved, Gentiles had to convert to Judaism as well as believe in Jesus. They taught that Gentile believers in Jesus had to receive the Jewish rite of circumcision. They had to keep the kosher dietary laws. They had to observe the Jewish holidays. These teachers had followed Paul from Jerusalem to Antioch to Asia Minor. There's no sign that they had made it to Philippi yet, but Paul wasn't taking any chances. He writes, beware of them, steer clear, watch out for them. Rather than preaching the gospel, they were peddling self-righteous religion. Rather than trusting in Christ alone for salvation, Rather than trusting in his suffering, his death on the cross, his resurrection alone, they were adding human works to the salvation equation. It's Christ plus my circumcision. It's Christ plus my kosher diet. It's Christ plus my observance of the holy days. 
But Paul wrote in the letter to the Galatians that to add any requirement at all to the work of Christ is to strip the gospel of all of its power entirely. Christ plus anything equals nothing. You know, at first glance, it might seem like the Judaizers aren't much of a problem for us. I mean, we really don't have many people traveling through the churches today telling people that they have to get circumcised or eat kosher. But if you step back and you think about it, some of the two billion people who call themselves Christians today have fallen into the very trap that Paul warns about in Philippians 3. Rather than trusting in Christ and his cross alone for salvation, they fall into the trap of self-righteous religion. Paul unpacks what that looks like using himself as an example. For one thing, religion relies heavily on birthright. That's the way it was for Paul. He was no convert to the Jewish faith. He was born a Jew. He could trace his lineage to the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Israel's first king. Benjamin was the only son of Jacob who was born in the promised land, and he was born to Jacob's favorite wife. He was Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin stayed loyal to David, and, and they, along with Judah, were the two who remained faithful to the Lord. So Paul had a very good religious pedigree. Religion also relies upon religious rites. Paul wasn't circumcised as an adult convert to Judaism. He was circumcised on the eighth day, just as God had instructed Abraham. See, he had the most authentic ceremony that anyone could have, and he faithfully participated in all the Jewish ceremonies. How many people who call themselves Christians today rely especially on those two things? They believe that God will receive them into heaven because of their birthright and because of religious rites that they've participated in. I was born Catholic. I was born Orthodox or Episcopalian or Lutheran or Presbyterian or Methodist or Baptist or Evangelical. I was born Pentecostal. Shandala, I'm going to make it. <laughs> For some people, it's just, I was born an American, and everybody knows God is on our side. I was baptized as an infant. I received my first Holy Communion at seven. I was confirmed at 13. Maybe even a bishop or a cardinal officiated. For some people, what they are really relying on for salvation is their family's religious affiliation rather than on Christ and his cross. It was that way for Paul before he met Jesus. Religion also relies upon accumulating religious knowledge. Even though Paul was born outside of Israel, his parents made sure that he had a premier Jewish education. Most Jews born abroad spoke only Greek, but Paul spoke both Hebrew and Aramaic. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a star pupil of the renowned scholar Gamaliel. He studied the Jewish faith meticulously. It's likely that he memorized most or all of the Old Testament. Religion also relies upon displaying religious zeal. The personal sacrifices and the grand gestures we make to show how religious we are. Paul was a Pharisee the strictest sect of Judaism. He kept the law meticulously to show his zeal. He became a fierce persecutor of the church. If there are many people who rely on their birthright and religious rights, how many others rely on their religious knowledge and zeal? They believe that God will receive them in heaven because of how much they've studied or because how much Christian service they've rendered or how many sacrifices they've made. And by the way, I want you to know that you don't have to be religious at all to be self-righteous. Many people believe that if there is a heaven, they're surely entitled to go there simply because they've endeavored to be good people. I've been an upstanding citizen. I've served my country. I've lived a clean life. I, I've contributed to society. I've worked hard. I've done well. I've been responsible with my money. I've provided for my family. I've been generous to the less fortunate. I've been a faithful husband or wife. I've been a devoted father or mother. I've served my community. I've stood up for just causes. I drive a Prius. <laughs> 
I recycle. I rescue shelter animals. Can I tell you all those things are good, but they're not good enough. Whether it be religious self-righteousness or non-religious self-righteousness, Paul calls all of it putting confidence in the flesh. Self-righteous religion steals joy. It diverts people away from true belief into unbelief. Paul uses very harsh words in chapter 3, verse 2, against the Judaizers. He calls them dogs. Dogs was a slur that Jews used against Gentiles. Dogs are scavengers. They'll eat anything, even their own vomit. And all God's people said, yuck. <laughs> Since Gentiles didn't obey the kosher diet, the Jews consider them like dogs. They'll eat anything. But now Paul is using that slur against these Jews. They were born to be true believers, but they had become like unbelievers. You see, that's precisely what self-righteousness does. It strips us of true faith, and it makes us like unbelievers. Self-righteous religion steals joy. It makes people into unwitting operatives of the enemy. Paul says that the Judaizers are evil workers. In other words, they are unwitting enemy operatives. They are spreading a gospel that is no gospel at all. It does not liberate. It does not save. It does not give joy. It does not lead to eternal life. It snares and condemns. Self-righteous religion steals joy. It mutilates genuine spiritual experiences. Because they practiced circumcision, the Jews were sometimes called the circumcision. But Paul says to these Judaizers, we are the true circumcision, not who have been circumcised in our flesh, but in our hearts. You are not the circumcision. You are the mutilation. You've taken what God ordained to be a dynamic spiritual experience and you've mutilated it into a ritual that's devoid of any real spiritual power. Beloved, can I tell you that water baptism was ordained by God to be a dynamic experience, spiritual experience in the life of someone who has believed on Jesus. Baptism is an act of repentance that releases the favor and the anointing of the Father on us. It seals the transaction of conversion in our heart. But when baptism is reduced to nothing more than a religious ritual, it mutilates the spiritual experience that God intended to convey through it. So that it's not a blessing, but it's actually harmful because it prevents us from knowing Jesus even more. So how do we avoid the trap of self-righteous religion? How do we make sure that our community here at Harvest Time is part of the true circumcision and not part of the mutilation? Paul gives us three things to look for in verse 3. First of all, let's worship by the Spirit. Paul says, they are the mutilation, but we are the true circumcision. We who worship by the Spirit of God. Jesus talked about that same thing. To a woman at the well, he said, Woman, the time is coming and now is when the Father is seeking those who worship him in spirit and in truth. To worship by the Spirit means that we are each personally indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Worship comes up from inside of us. It overflows from our heart. You know, that's why there's people here in the front waving flags and dancing before the Lord. And that's why people here sing their lungs out when they sing. It's because the worship comes up from inside of us, from the presence. You, you couldn't hold it back if you wanted to. You just have to let it out. You just have to express your passion and your love for the Lord. You ever come to church and you have a sore throat and you know you're not supposed to sing, but you can't help yourself. You just have to sing anyway because it's the Spirit of God inside of you. To worship by the Spirit means that we experience His presence among us as we worship. We can feel that God is here. To worship by the Spirit means that we are led corporately by the Spirit as we worship. How do we know we're part of the true circumcision? Worship by the Spirit and let's glory in Christ. To glory in Christ means 
is a way of saying we put our confidence in Christ. To glory in Christ means that our worship is Christ-centered. He is the subject of our worship. He is the one we address in our prayers. He is at the center of all of our teaching and preaching. We highly esteem the name of Jesus. We adore him in our worship. We call upon him in our prayers. You know, when you worship by the Spirit, the Spirit of God always points to the Son. And so where the Holy Spirit is active, Jesus will always be the object of worship. I don't know whether you've noticed, but in some movements, Jesus has kind of moved completely to the periphery. The cross is sort of the assumed background for everything, but it isn't explicitly talked about. The cross is not elaborated upon. It's not lifted up. The sermons center on personal empowerment, how to become the best version of you that you can be. But Jesus is just sort of the general context. He's not the specific focus. How do we know that we're part of the true circumcision? Three things to look for. Worship by the Spirit, glory in Christ, and let's put no confidence in the flesh. Let's not fall into the trap of self-righteous religion. You know, when I was praying over these scriptures this week, I felt a nudge from the Holy Spirit. Is it possible that we ourselves could have slipped just a little bit into the trap of self-righteousness? I mean, that could never happen to Pentecostal, charismatic, evangelical people like us, right? If we haven't kept our relationship with Jesus fresh and up to date, is it possible that we're relying more on our religious affiliation right now rather than relying directly on him? Is it possible that we're relying on some of our past religious experiences. I was born again and baptized in the Spirit at the age of eight. I was water baptized at the age of nine. I preached my first sermon at the age of 18. I was ordained at the age of 22. A presbyter laid hands on me. I've been prophesied over by some of the greats. But is it possible that we're relying on those past experiences rather than maintaining a fresh relationship with him? Is it possible that we're relying on our past service and sacrifices more than focusing on our present relationship with him? I've done every job there is to do in this church. I've taught Sunday school. I've sung in the choir. I've given to every building campaign. I never miss a Sunday except when I do. You see, the trap of self-righteous religion, it isn't just a danger for people in traditional liturgical churches. It is a danger for all of us. Let's put no confidence in the flesh. Rejoicing in the Lord, a simple recipe from Philippians 3. Avoid the trap of self-righteousness. Number two, to rejoice in the Lord, aspire to know Jesus more. Aspire to know Jesus more. If you want to rejoice in the Lord, learn to do some red ink thinking. Turns out that Paul not only had a PhD in philosophy... He was not only a best-selling author and an itinerant speaker, he was also a tradesman who ran small businesses in Israel, Turkey, Greece, and Italy. As such, Paul knew a little something about keeping books. He knew how to enter debits and credits on a ledger. Once Paul was in the trap of self-righteous religion, but when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, he began to think differently. In his mind, Paul had a whole ledger full of credits, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. But when Paul met Jesus, he began to think in red ink, and in his thinking, all of those credits were changed to debits. Whatever was my prophet, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And not only did Paul begin to think in red ink about his religious past, he began to think in red ink about all of life. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus as my Lord. Beloved, Paul is not saying that 
There is nothing noble or good or worthy or sweet in this life. God created it all. He takes pleasure in it all. And so can we. But what Paul is saying is that in comparison to knowing Jesus, the purest, noblest, most excellent experience in life is like pure rubbish. Actually, Paul uses a strong word here, a four-letter word. There's a perfect translation, translation in English, but if I use it, you throw me out of the pulpit. His point is that pursuing relationship with Christ was by far his first priority. I wonder if we think in red ink like Paul. The things that the people of the world consider credits. Do we consider them credits or, or do we consider them debits compared to knowing Jesus? And Paul didn't just think in red ink. He, he actually reordered his entire life to reflect his new Christian priorities. Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. More, more than that, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing him for whose sake I have lost all things. I have treated it like rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him. In other words, Paul said, I I took out the trash. I not only thought in red ink, but I removed from my life the things that were standing in the way of my pursuit of Christ. Paul's red ink thinking resulted in some purging and some rearranging in his life, and ours will too. What follows are some of Paul's most famous words of passion in the New Testament. I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, becoming like him in death. What do those words mean exactly? You know, they're very moving poetically, but, but, but what do they mean? Well, to know Christ in the power of his resurrection means to continually experience the new life that comes from believing in him. You see, there is a defining moment of believing on Jesus. There's a moment when the gift of faith from God comes into our heart. And during that moment, we experience an internal spiritual resurrection. Our spirit, which was dead in trespasses and sins, comes alive again and we become new creations and the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside of us and now we are empowered to walk in newness of life. To know Christ in the power of his resurrection means to experience life as that new creation. It means that I experience victory over the generational sins that have plagued my family for decades. It means I experience victory over my enemy in every part of my life. It means that I walk in anointing and authority and in holy confidence. It means that I enjoy heavenly experiences here on earth. To know Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings means that I continually live the crucified life like Jesus did. You see, only Jesus could bear the cross of Calvary. Only the blood of Jesus could make atonement for the sins of the whole world. There is no sacrifice that you or I could ever make that could add to Jesus once and for all sacrifice. But the cross was the culmination of Jesus' whole life lived in total surrender to the Father. The cross was the culmination of his life lived in humble submission, of his life lived in service to God. The cross was the culmination of Jesus' life lived in perfect obedience. Paul said, I want to be made like him in his death. What he's saying is, I want to experience that life of perfect obedience like Jesus. Jesus said, if any of us want to be his disciples, we must take up our cross and follow him. To know Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings is to have an ongoing experience of the crucified life. You know, it may involve actual suffering. It did for Paul. It did for the Philippians. But most importantly, it involves the daily surrender of ourselves to him. I want you to notice something with me. Jesus was crucified first, and then he rose again. But Paul switches the order for us. 
He says, I want to know Christ in his resurrection power and in the fellowship of his suffering. For Jesus, it was suffering and then resurrection. For us, it's resurrection and then the crucified life. Why? Well, it's because only Jesus could handle the cross. Only Jesus could humble himself and submit to the Father and obey and fully surrender to death on the cross. We're simply not strong enough to do that on our own. We need his resurrection power first and then we can completely surrender to God. We need to be spiritually resurrected first before we can lay down our lives to him. Now that summer is winding down and a new school year is about to begin, maybe this is a good time to sit down and do some red ink thinking and do some purging and some reprioritizing. Is it possible that right now you're riding on the spiritual fumes of your birthright or on the spiritual fumes of your past experiences and service and sacrifices? Is your ledger in order? Are the things that you consider credits really credits? Or should they be considered debits? Can you say with Paul that every other pursuit in life is pure rubbish in comparison to knowing Christ? I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection in the fellowship of his suffering. I want to experience Christ with me day in and day out. I want to experience Christ leading me moment by moment. I want to experience Christ bending my will in his direction. I want to experience Christ transforming my appetites and the desires of my heart. I want to experience Christ influencing my decisions. I want to experience Christ informing the words of my mouth. I want to experience Christ empowering me to take out the trash in my life. I want to experience Christ shining through me in my workplace. I want to experience Christ using me to bring healing and wholeness to my family, to influence my friends. I want to experience Christ using me in the gifts of the Holy Spirit to minister the supernatural love of God to people who are hurting and in need. Oh, that I may know him, that I might encounter his holy presence in worship, that I might learn more about him, fellowshipping with him in his word for every new thing I learn about him is a reason to love him more. That I might understand his ways by sharing about my experiences with fellow believers and hearing them share their experiences. Oh, that I might know him in the inner experience of resurrection and in walking daily in newness of life, in the moment-by-moment surrender of myself utterly and completely to him. Rejoicing in the Lord, a simple recipe from Philippians 3. Avoid the trap of self-righteous religion. Aspire to know Jesus more. And finally this, to rejoice in the Lord, anticipate acquittal on your finally. Anticipate acquittal on your finally. The first word of Philippians chapter 3 is a little bit puzzling. Paul says, finally. Now, finally usually means that a speaker is wrapping up. But finally is halfway through this letter. It seems that Paul was in good company. A father and son were in church one day and the boy heard the preacher say finally like he did every Sunday. But the boy noticed that each week when the preacher said finally, he went on talking for quite a bit more. So the boy pulled on his father's jacket and he said, Dad, what does finally mean? And the father said, absolutely nothing, son. Absolutely nothing. Why is there a finally halfway through the book of Philippians? Well, lots of reasons have been offered, but I'll give you the one I made up. For Paul, all of life boiled down to just one thing, and that is our finally. Paul was all about the final eternal outcomes, even as a Jewish scholar. Life for Paul was all about that moment that we leave this earthly existence and we go stand before God Almighty. For years, Paul tried with all his might to earn the right to enter heaven by pursuing religious knowledge and demonstrating religious zeal, but no more. 
Paul said, I've done some red ink thinking and I've taken out the trash. I've purged and I've reprioritized so that I might be, so that I might gain Christ and be found in him. When will he be found in him? On that great and final day when he stands before the Lord. May I be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own making from trying to keep the law, but having a righteousness from God which comes through faith in Christ. I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering becoming like him in his death and so somehow attain to the resurrection of the dead. Beloved, at the end of this life, each one of us will stand before Jesus and we will give an account of ourselves. As my friend Jackson Sinyanga says, I don't say that to scare you, I say that to terrify you. And what of life on earth will matter then? Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What will it matter then if you live the American dream if you lose your own soul? What will it matter then if you had that picture-perfect family, if you looked great every year on your family Christmas card and you lose your own soul? What will it matter if your kids become doctors or lawyers or bankers or singing sensations or pro athletes and lose their own souls? What will it matter if you're the envy of all your friends? What will it matter if you checked off all the items on your bucket list if in that moment you lose your own soul? What earthly pursuit of yours will possibly matter then? It almost sounds as if Paul is uncertain whether he'll make it or not. I can assure you Paul was not uncertain. He already wrote to the Philippians, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To go and be with Christ is far better. The only thing Paul is unsure about here is whether he will go in the rapture or whether he'll pass through the doorway of death and rise again. But either way, Paul is certain that when he stands before the Lord, he will be acquitted simply because he believed on Christ and Christ alone. And that is how Paul maintained his joy in prison. That's how he maintained his joy in shackles, awaiting capital trial. Nero couldn't take Paul's joy away because Paul's joy was in the Lord. The Praetorian guard couldn't take Paul's joy away because Paul's joy was in the Lord. The Judaizers couldn't take Paul's joy away. Iodia and Syntyche quarreling in the Philippian church couldn't take Paul's joy away because Paul's joy was in the Lord. And when we learn how to rejoice in the Lord, nothing and no one can ever take our joy away either. Rejoicing in the Lord, a simple recipe. Avoid the trap of self-righteous religion. Aspire to grow in your relationship with Jesus and anticipate acquittal. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place? Come on, let's give him a good praise this morning.